All right, so let's focus a little bit about how work is involved with um, thermodynamic processes. All right, so here I have a depiction of a container of gas, and usually we depict it vertically, but I'm looking at it from the side here just for the sake of easiness here. So we've got the gas on the left, some sort of movable piston, and then let's say the atmosphere on the right. Um, so if we have the gas expanding, what we have going on is that the force of the gas on the piston is greater than the force exerted by the atmosphere. So therefore we have a net force rightward and an acceleration rightward. So if the gas expands, it displaces some amount, let's say to the right, okay? So first I'm gonna focus on expansion and the work done by the gas, all right? So we have work being F D cosine theta. So F is the force we're analyzing. So here we're analyzing the force of the gas. We're not analyzing the net force here, just the force by the gas. Um, if that force is parallel to displacement, then work is positive, right? Because then cosine theta is cosine of zero, which is one. Um, and then if it's anti-parallel, so if force and displacement are in opposite directions, then cosine of 180 gives us uh, negative work. So our picture here, it's displacing to the right, and my force of the gas is to the right. So therefore, the work done by the gas is positive, right? The force of the gas is what we're dealing with. So this is the force, um, this is the work done by that force of the gas, and that's a positive value. Thing is, is when the way that we've defined the first law of thermodynamics, um, it's that we're looking at the work done on the gas, not by the gas. I know, annoying, but. Um, so the work done on the gas is the work done by the external force here, so the force of the atmosphere. So the, the external force is leftward, but the gas is expanding, so the displacement's rightward. So the work done by the, uh, the work done on the gas, excuse me, is negative, all right? So just remember that's the, the work we're dealing with on our formula sheet. Um, so therefore, if our gas is expanding, the work done on it is negative. If it's contracting though, then this external force is in the same direction as the displacement of the gas, and therefore the work done by the, or excuse me, on the gas is positive. Why is this all useful aside from plugging in the formula? Well, these graphs, these PV diagrams are super useful in terms of computation, simple computation. In fact, if I'm gonna put money on your AP exam, I'm gonna say, as long as there's multiple choice questions, um, you're gonna have a PV diagram and computing the area of this diagram. The reason for that is, so remember uh, last lesson, we had a formula for the work done on a gas for an isobaric process. So as long as pressure is constant, we said it was negative P delta V. Um, what that means in terms of this graph, well, we've got pressure on one axis, volume on the other. So when you multiply them together, you get work. So the only trick here is thinking about whether this work is a positive or negative value in terms of our formulas. Um, and here, since this process is, is showing that the volume is expanding, our gas is expanding, so the work done on the gas is negative, right? So same thing here. So just be careful with that, right? You might think, oh, this is a positive area for the graph, therefore work is positive. No, you have to look at the direction of the process, right? So for example, if this was the opposite and it was going from the final state to the initial, well, it would be initial to final, but you know what I mean, hopefully. <laughs> but if it was a, a, so to speak, leftward process here, then the gas is contracting. So uh, that would be a positive value for the work because that would be um, adding energy to the gas. <laughs> so, uh, so that's something to be careful with, but this makes, this is nice because we can just basically read values off of a PV diagram as long as the graph is simple and compute the work. Um, similarly, in theory, we could generalize this, right? And actually, even if we're dealing with maybe some sort of, um, well, maybe this was an isothermal process, for instance, um, it would be some sort of curve. The thing is, we don't really have a means without calculus to compute the area under this curve. 
Um, so in our class, you don't, we don't have to do anything funky here. Maybe you could approximate with a triangle and know that the work you compute is too large here because the curve is concave down. Um, but nonetheless, pretty useful. Uh, a lot of times we'll be dealing with straight line graphs because just so that you can um, use this idea of area giving you work. So let's look at an example of this. All right, so let's look at this expanding gas. We have a cylinder with a movable piston and it has 0.016 moles of helium. A researcher expands the gas via a process illustrated in the figure. To achieve this, does she need to heat the gas? If so, how much heat energy must be added or removed? <laughs> All right, so we see here that the gas started at um, a value of 400 kilopascals and a volume of 100 centimeters cubed and then the volume was expanded uh, to a value of 300 centimeters cubed while the pressure decreased by half. And they did this in such a way where it, this was a linear process um, on this PV diagram, right? So you could kind of take another, uh, any moment, another state in time, and it'd be lay, lying along this line. All right, so does she need to add or remove heat? Well, heat is a form of energy, so we can compute the work to see uh, what we have going on. All right, so here, listing what we know, we know the number of mole, and then we know values of pressure and volume for our initial and final states. So initial I'll call one, and final I'll call two. Uh, I also listed here our uh, first law of thermodynamics, so since we're trying to compute the amount of heat, we can compute the change in energy minus the work, all right? So let's first compute the work since we can do that by uh, computing our the area of this graph, all right? So I wrote here, well, work is going to be actually negative the area, right? Because our gas is expanding, so the work done on the gas is negative. Um, so negative value of the area. So the area is going to be I kind of divide it into two chunks, this triangle along with this rectangle. So just be careful, you do need to extend this to the horizontal axis, all right? So um, I did that here and giving us a value of work of negative 60 joules. I recommend computing it yourself to make sure you agree, all right? So the work done on the gas during this expansion is negative 60 joules. All right, and this makes sense because the gas is expanding, so it's gonna lose energy. We can also compute the change in uh, internal energy of our gas, right? So change in internal energy is gonna be three halves K times delta T. Remember K here is Boltzmann constant, and T is their change in temperature. So we do need to compute the value for our temperature in the initial and final state. So we can do that using the ideal gas law, right? So I did that. What's nice here is they give us the number of moles, so we can use the NR form of the ideal gas law, and we know the initial conditions for pressure and volume, so we compute the temperature. So even though the problem did not state what the initial temperature was, I was able to compute that. We had enough information for that initial condition. All right, so this is important because sometimes in problems you'll need to do this. Um, so anyway, so I did that for the initial and final and found that the temperature increased by 450 uh, Kelvin. So using the uh, formula here, we find that the internal temp, uh, excuse me, the change in internal energy is 30 joules. All right, so heat is gonna be 30 minus negative 60 being 90 joules. So yes, we do have heat added because we got a positive value here of 90 joules. Um, so this is a very nice example of how we can use many ideas in thermodynamics here. Right, so we have a graph with pressure volume diagram. Um, we're learning information about that graph as well as initial conditions using the first law of thermodynamics. We're using a definition for change in internal energy. We're computing area and work. We're using the um, ideal gas law, a whole bunch of ideas all accumulating to something that's overall not that difficult to do. Um, straightforward, you just have to be careful with your negative signs. I think that might be the the most difficult part about this problem, at least computationally. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is kind of the last uh, type of thermal process we're going to be dealing with. So we kind of have four in general, and this is the fourth, an adiabatic process. And what this is, 
is a process in which we have some sort of container of insulated uh, insulated container, so there's no heat exchange with the environment. Um, so there's no heat added or removed. So that's an adiabatic process, right? So if this gas is going to expand adiabatically, um, that means that Q is zero um, and work is going to be uh, negative, again, because we're expanding the gas. Uh, so this is going to imply that our change in internal energy is going to be negative, right? We see that from the first law of thermodynamics. So this implies that the temperature is going to decrease. All right. Um, so an adiabatic expansion lowers the temperature of a gas. And similarly, for compressing, it'd be the opposite. It'd be increasing the temperature. So for a PV diagram, here's a sample of what an uh, adiabatic process might look like. So you might see this curve and think, oh, this is an, um, why do I actually have that written as an isotherm? Oh, I see. Hold on a second. Uh, so what I have drawn here is not adiabatic processes and isotherm, um, but adiabatic processes on PV diagrams can basically take any shape. A lot of times it will be linear just for the sake of us being able to compute things, uh, but sometimes it might be a, a curved process. And that's actually typical of, of real life. Um, anyway, so here we have an isothermal compression from point one to point two. Let's sketch how this PV diagram would look if the gas were compressed from point one, point two, to the same final pressure by a rapid adiabatic compression. So again, no heat added or removed and temperature is allowed to change. All right, so I re-sketched the isotherm we had. I labeled that as T1, and that brought us from state one to state two. Now, if we had adiabatic compression, right, that would mean that the temperature of our gas would have to increase. Right, again, based on what I mentioned on the other slide here, um, since we have Q being zero, applying the first law of thermodynamics, our delta U would have to be positive, meaning temperature has to increase. So we would have to reach some other value for temperature that's larger. All right, um, so that, and what we know about, let's say if we draw like isotherms, we know that higher temperature isotherms will be kind of quote unquote higher or rightward um, on our PV diagram. So if I drew another isotherm that's even larger than T2, it'd be another um, another uh, hyper hyperbolic curve here and so on and so forth. Right. So we would reach some other temperature there that would be larger. So that would mean that our final point now is to the right of our initial point because it's gonna be some higher temperature, right? So what I've drawn here is some theoretical isotherm, um, though not necessarily necessary to draw here. But, so this would be an example of an adiabatic compression uh, that gets us from our initial state to what our new final state would be. I don't suspect you might have to do a problem like this on the AP exam, but I wanted to, to mention it nonetheless. So the last thing I wanna mention quickly is, oh, sorry about that is what happens when a gas goes through a series of processes called a cycle, right? So if we have a gas starting at some pressure volume and then going through some process, then another process, and then another process returns to that same pressure volume, that's called a cycle. So you'll see when you're drawing a PV diagram or you're looking at one, it, you have kind of a, uh, a shape that's all connected. Now, in terms of terminology, if the terminology says that it's a closed cycle, that means that it also it goes back to the initial state, meaning that it also starts it starts and ends at the same temperature as well, right? So just be careful because cycle and closed cycle have two different implied meanings. When you're working on the homework, uh, just be careful with that. So a fun problem you can, you can try here uh, for this PV diagram compute the ratio of the final temperature to the initial temperature here. Right. Have a great day.